Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Granby Board of Education meeting for Wednesday, September 18th, 2024. Um, uh, joining us tonight, we have Sophia Brenson, who is our new student rep. Um, I read this at our last meeting, but I'm going to go ahead and read it again since Sophia is here joining us. Sophia Brenson is a junior at Granby Memorial High School and carries an impressive <coughs> course load, taking a couple of UConn ECE courses. She's also a member of the varsity swim team. Sophia shared with Superintendent Burke that she applied to be a Board of Ed student representative to improve her public speaking skills, which she feels <coughs> is an important attribute to possess, as well as provide a service to the community. We welcome Sophia to the Board of Education and look forward to her contributions this school year. Thank you so much for joining us, Sophia. We are very happy to have you with us. Of course. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, we'll put you on the hot seat later because it appears that Katie is stuck at a volleyball game and won't be able to join us. So uh, it's going to be all you. You're taking charge. Of, <laughs> no of course you may. What's your best stroke? Uh, butterfly. Butterfly. Yeah. That's awesome. That was my best stroke in high school. Oh, really? so, yes. Um, I don't think I can do that. So <laughs> <laughs> throw that out there. Same. Welcome. <laughs> Um, we're going to be moving on to uh, awards and recognition. And tonight we have a very special community member joining us, uh, Meg Jabaley. You can join me at the podium if you don't mind. I do. It's good to see you. All right. As both a Granby parent and vice chair of the Granby Town Center study, Meg Jabaley approached Granby Public Schools about collaborating on her exciting work early last year. An expert in design thinking, Meg has a master's degree in design for human health from the Boston Architectural College and background in working with communities and children on projects to explore how one's environment impacts their health and well-being. Meg worked with small groups of students in pre-K, pre grade three, and grade seven in classroom-based workshops to teach the process of design thinking and integrated the students' creative ideas and problem solving into the work of the town center study. Granby Memorial Middle School teacher Jeannie Bryanton, is Bryanton, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, shared, Meg was extremely kind and patient with our energetic group of middle schoolers. She kept them engaged and really listened to their ideas for the center of town. The students thoroughly enjoyed working with her. Seventh grade students learned about behavior mapping and how they could embed elements in their design that would be behavior nudges. An example of this might be creating a seating area with stools that face one another to encourage dialogue. Third grade students used what they learned about ideation within the design thinking process to brainstorm how they could make suggestions about redesigning the open Wells Road courtyard with areas that would engage all of their senses. They culminated their work, their work for the year by planting a new tree in the center of the courtyard that will be the focal point and source of shade for beauty for year, and beauty for years to come. Ms. Lecco, and that was my son's teacher last year, he was very fortunate to be in this class, shared that Meg is organized, creative, and collaborative. She prepared every lesson in a way that was accessible to all students and sparked their interest and creativity through visuals, hands-on activities, and group work. Her passion for design rubbed off on students, making them just as invested in the project as she was. Ms. Lecco's third graders look forward to watching their tree grow and continuing to work with Ms. Bailey. And I can say that when we had open house um, or at the beginning of the school year, um, the first thing my son Sander did was run to the courtyard to see what the, how the tree was doing. So <laughs> it obviously had a very clear impact. Thank you for this enormous service to our community and being a part of so many uh, children's lives. Thank you so much. It's so Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, from the sure. Sure. Thank you. 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 No, it was all the students. They were amazing. Good, good creative thinkers. So, but it was really just amazing for you, amazing way to get engaged with the yeah. kids and on a whole new level. So, oh my gosh, and they were ready for it. They are prime. Thank good you design so much. Thinkers. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, we've inserted a, a, a program uh, this evening prior to public comment. Um, today we are going to be doing a district threat assessment protocol. Um, we're going to have Superintendent Sherry Burke along with uh, uh, Granby Police Chief Scott Sansom. Thank you. Today? I think that I'm going to go to the podium so that Scott and I can stand together for parts of our conversation. Need my glasses. Do you need oh, yours? Yeah, okay. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you, uh, Chief Sansom, for joining us tonight. Um, you know, we wanted to take this opportunity to um, express some of the ongoing work, um, most of it behind the scenes, related to um, crisis uh, protocol and procedures, in particular if there is a threat. Um, you know, in light of recent events here in our own community, as well as um, just a significant increase in threats and threatening language across our schools, uh, you know, here in Connecticut and certainly nationwide. Um, we know that school violence is, you know, something that's on the forefront of everyone's mind and student and staff and community safety is something that we take very seriously. We work in concert together um, and we put an exorbitant amount of energy into the prevention and really trying to understand the best possible ways to prepare should there be. Um, a need for us to, to respond to a crisis. Um, and so together with um, Chief Sansom, I wanted to share the opportunity um, to really just give you a high level overview of our district's protocols when dealing with threats or, or a variety of different ways that um, emergency situations occur in our schools. Um, we do have very detailed um, security and uh, safety plans, all hazard security and safety plan. We file that with the state of Connecticut annually. It is updated. There are many requirements of us um, to partner with our community agencies, you know, EMS and, and fire and police, as well as, you know, town manager and Farmington Valley Health District. There's just a whole group of community servants, truly, that collaborate to develop the plan. Um, and we meet quarterly across, across the year. So these protocols are are very alive and well in our district. Um, and for obvious reasons, many of those details can't be shared tonight and can't be shared publicly um, because it is that opportunity um, to be ready that we want to keep many of those details um, secure with the emergency responders and school officials, you know, as needed. Um, so there are many things that we can't discuss publicly, but we wanted to still provide that higher level view um, so that people can understand the process, you know, that we go through. Um, so at, what you're seeing here is a um, publication uh, that our team worked on, frankly, over the last couple of days to take our policy, which is policy 5141-6, that's a public policy written by CAVE that you can see on our website. And we wanted to flesh that out and just really make it a more living document so that parents could digest what that policy really means. Because we live this all the time, but it's not something that we talk about very frequently. And I certainly learned um, over the past week that there were many questions in the community about, well, what if? And, and how do you handle that? And how often are you talking with the cops? And what do you do? So um, the, the policy outlines these four um, verbs, these four actions that we would take, prevent, prepare, respond, and reflect. There's variations of that, I assume, you know, for, for your um, emergency response. And there's variations of this um, across different school districts. But in a nutshell, this is what we're all striving, you know, to do. Um, so the first um, line of defense is truly prevention, and that's what you see here. Um, our theme this year um, starts with the word connect because we know that relationships matter. Um, having relationships, knowing the people in our community, collaborating with um, our teachers and students and volunteers and bus drivers and maintenance and custodial staff. This is the way that we prevent um, a, a student 
rising to the level of requiring a risk assessment or a threat assessment, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So this list of things are, I think, pretty obvious. They're things that we've talked about to the board about a number of times. Um, we are always looking to um, ensure that children have positive mental wellness. We know that you know things like exercise and participating in athletic teams, we partner with the Farmington Valley YMCA to make sure that our children and our teens have outlets um, to foster positive relationships. I think that that is one of the most important things that we do um, to really stay in front of potential challenges. The more we get to know our students and the more ways we support their wellness, um, physical and mental health, the better off we're going to be when problems arise for children because we know that that's certainly um, a very real part of our, our work. Um, one of our leading partners in this work is the Farmington Valley Health District. We work very closely with them. I had an opportunity last year to actually um, act in some lessons that were published through our high school students, um, you know, green screen efforts and really developing um, little public service announcements and lessons that could be used around mental health and, and friendships and allies and those sorts of things. So um, we're very involved and active in that prevention space. If you could move forward just a little bit, please. Thank you. Um, the next component is prepare. You know, how do we prepare for the worst, right? We always want to um, think about what could happen and is our staff and our students truly prepared if an emergency arises. I know when I was in school, and Scott and I are of similar age, was fire drill, fire drill, fire drill, fire, fire drill. <laughs> we had lots of fire drills, and we did them when the weather was nice. Um, well, we've learned that that's not enough, and so the state statute 10-231 requires that we not only hold fire drills, I believe it's every third drill is supposed to be a fire, we also need to engage in other types of crisis drills so that students and teachers and all staff on our, on our school buildings is engaging in opportunity to practice because we know that it needs to be muscle memory when it's time to go into that shelter in place or in a true lockdown experience. So those drills are really important. Um, and there are a number of expectations around the drills, lockdown drills. We often have um, an officer from the Granby Police joining us to engage and reflect and offer critiques about how that lockdown went. I was at the middle school for their first fire drill of the season a couple weeks ago. You could have heard a pin drop. Hundreds of sixth, seventh, and eighth graders outside on a beautiful day. They take it seriously. They follow the directions like a well-oiled machine so that when there is a crisis, we can automatically know what to do. Um, you know, there's all kinds of other professional development and training. Our staff has engaged in regular training with things like QPR, question, persuade, respond, so that we know how to help children that perhaps are experiencing suicidal tendencies or ideation. We have crisis management and training around well-being, and we're always working collaboratively with the police um, to make sure that our trainings are up to date. And if there's anything more that our staff needs, we want to make sure that we're offering that. To the right-hand side here, you see stop it. Um, in a recent communication, I, I praised the use of the Stop It app, and we've done that here at the board. Um, the Stop It app is an uh, uh, application, a little app, on all of the students' Chromebooks um, that they can access at the secondary level. And I believe Wells Road School also has access to it. Um, we primarily focus on our secondary age because those students are of the age where they can independently report with enough information for follow through, but parents can also access this app. And I give you the steps here so you can understand how to access that and how to use it. Um, go to the Granby site, it's, it's right there. You can put it into the search bar and it pops right up. Um, and um, it's a really awesome opportunity for community. If you see something, say something. We want to know. It alerts our school administration and we follow up on every single stop it notification. Um, this can be from you know mean-spirited behavior. I'm feeling unsafe on the bus. It could be, I think somebody has a weapon. The gamut. Um, and our administrators get those alerts at all times of the day and night, and we monitor it very closely. 
Um, you know, the last thing that I want to talk about is that we have had intense training on threat and risk assessment procedures, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more now. But these are research-based practices that we must engage in specific training for. Um, so the next section is respond. Um, and respond is, I, it was challenging to put this in one document because it's so situational. And that's what Scott and I talk about a lot. Uh, Sergeant Laflamme is in our schools all the time. We're always talking through situations. Uh, that's why those relationships are so important because when you know the children, when you know the families, it's so much easier to crack the code of like, what level is this? Um, situation. But the word I've learned from those in law enforcement is imminent danger. <laughs> so if there is imminent danger, we are acting immediately. That is a lockdown, a shelter in place. We're dialing 911 because we know that there is harm coming. We're in harm's way. We always err on the side of caution. So um, when a principal calls me and we're talking through something, often at like 5.30, 6 in the morning, we, we challenge each other. How do you know? Did you see it yourself? Who saw it? Did you talk to the kid? Do you know that kid? What's their background? How long have they been in your school? We're doing these kinds of things as a matter of our practice because we know that seconds matter and we know that we have to get it right. Um, and so, you know, when we are in this situation, we then go to, okay, this is a threat. I need to conduct a threat assessment to determine is this a viable threat or not. And we were all just retrained last year. This is frequent training that's happening um, in all school, school districts. It's not unique to Granby given the status of the world. Um, and once we conduct that threat assessment, which I'm going to share on the next page a little more about that, we decide, is this a real threat? Because kids use threatening language all the time, unfortunately. I, I mean, I, I can confidently say just about daily, children between the ages of four and 18 are saying things that we, we take pause with. 99.8% of the time, it is not a real threat, a viable threat. It's coming from frustration, anger, lack of communication to be able to express themselves. But every single time it happens, we have to look into that and we take it seriously. We don't want to be desensitized to the fact that someone used strong language around killing, shooting, or endangering themselves or others. So we go through the protocol every single time. And then we decide no action is required. There is no access to weapons. That's where our friends come in. Um, their parents are aware and cooperative. The child doesn't have a plan. You know, there's a bunch of things that we look at. Um, and then we work through the list of what do we need to do. Oftentimes, we need to get that child help, regardless of whether or not they are, have the means to carry out a particular threat. We care about each and every child. We want every child to be their best version of themselves. And if they're hurting in some way, that matters. And so oftentimes, we're calling 211. We're convening our crisis team, our mental health professionals within the school. We're almost always <laughs> reaching out to Granby Police to say, can you help us out with this one? There was a weapon involved. We need to do a weapons check, whatever it might be. And that's so important. It's really not a law enforcement role at that point. And really, it's maintenance, too. It's not we have a situation, we deal with the situation. It's going to be a continual maintenance, and it's going to be something that you're going to have to do to get that child back on board to wherever they need to be. Um, it's really not an arrest. Or like, the arrests aren't going to fix this. Um, so law enforcement, and, and a lot of this, other than the imminent threat, we're kind of like way at the bottom um, and participating that way. But um, you'll see time and time again that places that do get it right, it's because they identify a child through risk assessment. And, and saw the need uh, for extra help and got them through um, what they were dealing with and, and then continued to maintain it, didn't treat it as an incident, um, which is so important. And research tells us that those incidences are just like the little tip of the iceberg. There's almost right. always other things. And, and if you let your guard down, you don't pay attention, that's when problems usually right. happen in the future, sometimes more so than yes. the initial problem. Yep. So 
so that, that level of investigation on the school side happens absent of or in concert with the police, really just about do we need a weapons check, do we need a wellness visit to the home. Um, and then we have to revisit that initial piece. Now do we have to go into a lockdown? Did I learn more? They, they have a weapon in their backpack, there's something concerning. We're always revisiting that imminent danger threat because it, it ebbs and flows. We learn more, you, you know better, you do better every, t every step along the way. Um, so we can always revisit. Throughout the process, we are communicating, and I need to say very directly that communication is not our first um, priority. Our first priority is the safety and well-being of the individuals in our school district. I consider myself personally responsible for every single person in our school district. We talk about this a lot. I know Scott feels the same way about the greater Granby community. We do what we can at all costs to make sure that the district is safe. I am a parent too, and I know how it feels, how unsettling it is, and you're waiting for the text to come. Um, and so our initial communication will be basic. It will be missing a lot of detail because we want you to know we're going into lockdown. We're aware that there's a problem. We're investigating. It's always going to be less than you want. <laughs> and it may not even be all of the story because we're still actively investigating and learning more. So what we try to do is an initial, quick, here's what we know at this time. Schools are open. School's safe. Please come. Blah, blah, blah. We're in lockdown. There's a bear on the playground. Whatever we know, we communicate. And then we're still actively working. And then we follow up with, with as much as we can. And that takes a lot of effort because communications have to be right. They have to be timely, certainly. And they have to be um, uh, lawful. <laughs> There's many things we can't divulge. And um, so we do have to protect the privacies of everyone involved. And oftentimes, that will read like we're not giving you every detail. Well, especially with juveniles, uh, there's things that, and you know, managing social media and things that we're like, oh, this is the threat. And it's like, yep, there's a threat to blow up the school and shoot and this. And then when we get to the end of it, oh, no, it was a lunch argument that had nothing to do with a TV show that they were talking about. And so to create hysteria, a wreck a child's um, reputation. reputation for forever, especially because of social media, um, it's a very delicate balance. For us to control social media is very difficult, right? Um, and we really can't, we use social media to our advantage and follow up all those leads and, and we'll do that, but um, we can't control what's out there. So um, that's, I think, controlling the fear of crime you know, we're, we're right on. The, the, the easy part is the response, right? And until I know as, as chief, and my, my captain's not here because it's his birthday, you know, uh, he's extremely vested. He's been here 25 years. You know, his wife is a teacher in town, but he's immediately on the phone getting me out of bed saying, hey, this is what we got, this is what we're doing. Um, and I'm just like, yeah, go send a cop, hire an extra, figure out until we, until we know what we have. Um, let's go a little extra and a little heavy so everyone's safe. Because then we figure out, there's, there's a protocol that we use. Where's the child um, immediately? Where's the child? So all right, this is where they are. Okay, what, what access um, to weapons? Right, those are the first two things that we're we're right on immediately to freeze the situation to give us time to now investigate. Well, what happened? And is there anything else to that? So immediate is like safety. So you might see a little bit of overkill, which some people get upset at us at that. And we're like, why is there a cop at the school? Why is you know they're creating hysteria? Because we really we're at the point that we. It's better to have that than to not, right? Because you don't want to look back. And I tell my officers, and we're trained this way. We're, we've all been trained um, for years now, unfortunately. Um, most of your police department in Granby has well over 20 years on. They're most retired from somewhere else, usually bigger cities and stuff. So uh, they know what to do. They know what to look for. Um, but like you said, all that stuff, the initial response is easy. The, the harder part and the important part, the part that takes a lot of work is having that community within your schools and within your cultures to develop that you can see it right away before it gets to us. Like, we want to put the police department out of business with this stuff. We, um, but that means a lot of work on the other side of 
investing in the child and, and creating that culture. Right. It's kind of like, you know, I explained when I've talked about, you know, these school shootings and these threats and stuff. It's like kind of knowing your family. When you know your child and he says, yeah, I'm going to kill everybody. And this is, you know, rah, 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 and, and they storm out into the room. And you're like, well, you know your child. You have that and you know, like, he doesn't mean it. Or there's sometimes where, like, my child's going through a lot. This is what it is. And, and you're on the phone trying to get a, a psychologist to talk to them. Yeah. Well, if we can put that family environment, that culture that you develop in your own families within the school systems, right? Um, I was always, I always taught, like, try to have every child have a mentor. I don't care who the child is, from your brightest to, to your lowest, highest, what scores they have, what their behavior is. Um, if everyone has that, that's usually going to, that's about the best you can do because that's usually where you're going to sign up. When they have someone that they can go to that's an adult, and it doesn't need to be a teacher. It could be a teacher, social worker. It could be the janitor. Some adult in their life that's within the school system that they see every day. Yeah. Um, it really works. It's, it's simple stuff. Yeah. I can come in here and give you lectures, and I can talk forever. Um, that's why I'm not at the podium. You're, you're feeling uh, me do this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but the SWAT stuff, the, the, I can tell you how protocols, how we respond and do that stuff. But we are immediately on it, and me and Sherry talk all the time. And because we are small, it's great. Because mm -hmm. it's like, hey, this is what we got. And, this, mm -hmm. and I can share a lot more with Sherry that, that maybe I'm not supposed to, but it's in the benefit of the town. And other uh, kids, I'm going to do it. I'm like, hey, this yeah. is what we got. So, did you know this? Do we know that? Yeah. And you know, we do everything within the perimeter law the best we can to keep this place safe. And like mm -hmm. I told Sherry, and, and she said the same thing. She said, listen, our responsibility is the safety of these, these kids. And for, for me, and everybody in town. And I really take that seriously. That's why I'm bald. I've been bald since <laughs> I've been a policeman. Um, it really does. And I said, don't worry, Sherry, because in the end, it's me that's they're going to blame. I said, so throw the blame to me. Um, so the next um, section just defines a little bit more about threat. Threat is a word we're hearing a lot right now. The news media is picking up. Um, they're swatting the challenges where, you know, um, threats that are coming from other places in the country, um, but they're targeting schools in our area. I'm sure Scott could explain that way better than me. Um, but, you know, and then there's social media, TikToks. There's all kinds of things happening in our own community and in our neighboring communities. Um, and so threat is a word that evokes some really strong feelings. Most of the time, kids are using dangerous or threatening language um, that doesn't result in a, in a viable threat. And like I said earlier, we still pay attention. But there's a definition that we use um, as a part of our threat assessment training. Um, and then I did already mention the threat assessment training and response team that our administration and our crisis teams have all been trained in. Um, it's the CSTAG model. Um, that is a live link that will bring you to the research and understanding behind that model. It's an evidence-based approach. It follows five steps. Evaluate the threat. Attempt to resolve if it's transient. Transient means this is not imminent danger. This is not a viable, defined threat. But there's some concern. So let's try to resolve this. Let's work with the social worker. Let's work with the child. Respond to a substantiated threat. That's when we know we've got something real here. We need to pay close attention to it. We must respond often with emergency personnel. Conduct a safety evaluation, a, um, a substanti substi substantiated threat. Absolutely, we're calling the police um, for wellness checks to the home, uh, investigation if there perhaps is any criminal behavior, and certainly just to make sure that if there's weapons, um, we know that there's weapons in the home. Um, and then implement and monitor a safety plan, and safety plans are fluid. They take time. They allow kids to come back to the school environment. There are for children that have been impacted by this incident in any way. Um, but certainly, uh, we focus on, on the impact of the situation, whether it's a viable threat or not. If you could go to the next section, please, Catherine. Uh, risk assessment is a little different. Um, a risk assessment is common in our schools um, through our social worker, our school psychologists, our, our clinicians, um, really identifying when students need additional supports, like you just said, you know your kid, something's a little off. So depression, anxiety, school avoidance, um, eating disorders, uh, d depression shows its way in different forms. Um, and so we are 
we have trained professionals in risk assessment um, because this is where that prevention is so important. Um, kids that are at risk um, require a, a specialized level of intervention and we want to make sure that we're doing that. And then the last component is just recovery or reflection. And for us, reflection is so important. Um, that's where we are sitting at the table with any emergency responders, principal, school-based crisis team, and we're debriefing. How'd we do? We're our own worst critics, as Scott said. We're trained to kind of say, what if? Should I have? What did I do differently? Something took a little longer than we would have liked. How can we improve that for next time? Um, and so that reflection really fuels that cycle of p continuous growth, um, and we take that very seriously. The next page is a little bit about um, law enforcement and the role of the police. Um, so if there's anything you want to elaborate on there, Scott? Yeah, you know, just like I said earlier, you know, with the police department, what usually starts, starts at the school, right? And um, listen, like this last incident, everything worked right because people report it, right? Where there was just a little bit of smoke that you know, social media, I think, got a hold of things. And, uh, but where there was a little bit of smoke, the reporting system worked. Um, and then we respond immediately. And like I said, we go, we immediately find out, okay, where's the child? Where's the threat coming from? Um, do they have access to weapons? And then, and then we evaluate from there. Um, it usually requires a home visit. We, we um, get together with the parents. We come up with a plan. We make sure everything's secured, and then once that's settled, and then it goes back to Sherry and say, okay, now what are we doing to, to move forward? But on a police response, that's it. Um, you know, the, the best thing uh, to do, we try to do that without disrupting the child's life in school and you know, everything else. People say, oh, do you, do you like cops in schools? And I would say, no, I don't like cops in schools. I don't think it's appropriate. I see a uniformed police officer patrolling the hallways you know, and as some of you know, I, I come, you know, 20 years of Hartford and 10 years in Hartford and urban environment. It's just, I'm like, we're not going to do that. I'll have an SRO program because uh, having an SRO program is totally different. They're not in uniform. There's a law enforcement presence in the school for immediate response. But the more important thing is the officer ends up becoming an advocate for the child um, when the discipline is from school. And that's usually where we get all our information. So. Stuff like this doesn't really get to a level because there's an immediate, the officer walks over to the group of kids, they know the group of kids, and they'll say, hey, what's going on? And they can, they can address it right there immediately before it, it gets um, too out of control. Um, when you don't have that, and um, I don't think, have you ever had a SRO program here? Not here, I'm good. So um, uh, when, it's, when it's done right, and there's an MOA, I was a big proponent of legislating uh, uh, an MOA between the school and the police departments. Um, they do have that now. They did it when I brought uh, the MOA to Hartford to reduce school-based arrest and to East Hartford, which are much different communities. But the SRO will become the culture of the what the, the board of ed or what... Really a tool in that prevention yeah, piece. And they yeah, become a, they become part of the culture of the school and how they want them to act and be. Because um, if not, we remove them. <laughs> but it's, uh, but there's, yeah. a, there's a tremendous asset there. Yeah. But that's it in a nutshell. And like I said, I can go on for hours. Of, we do have access. We have our own um, regional SWAT team. We have, we have all the tools. We have immediate um, plans already in place for the school. And um, we practice all the time. Very heavily trained if something did happen where it got away from us and we weren't able to address it in the early end. Good thing is there's been some incidents, even in the year I've been here, and I know before that were handled before they be, became. became it's hard to measure what the good work that you, you um, the teachers are, and the school is already doing to mitigate a lot of this stuff. It's just hard to measure, right? Um, so that's a good thing. Thanks, Scott. And just the last um, section is just what can parents do? Um, and, and this is um, just some guidelines to consider. It takes a little bit of patience from all of us when these issues are first popping. Um, we want to hear from you and we want to be able to um, collaborate with you in those early stages. So please, nothing is too small to reach out and report those concerns. Um, we recently shared uh, addressing school concerns like spread, you know, flow chart. I linked it here. It has all of our numbers. Very easy to get a hold of people. I also can't 
emphasize enough the importance of checking your school messenger accounts to ensure that you have checked all the right boxes to get calls and texts and emails. Typically, we're using an email system because there's not imminent danger, because there's not. But if there were, there was a active shooter, God forbid, if there was anything of significant emergent an issue, you would be getting alerts, likely not only from the school district. I mean, we have town alert system. We have our, our school messenger alerts. We would be using all of that. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that people are accessing the tools that you do have as parents and community members. Um, Contacting your child directly during the school day puts them in harm's way. It puts them in harm's way. If we're in lockdown, it needs to be silent. Kids are good about keeping their phones on silent. And um, I know that what the temptation is. I, I'm a mom of, of four children, um, college through elementary. I totally get it. Um, but that could put us in harm's way. Um, let your child call you. <laughs> um, don't wait to share something with us. I think that's the other thing I really wanted to emphasize. Um, see something, say something goes for everyone in our community to help keep us safe. Um, and social media and other vehicles of communication will not result in the most accurate information. Please just keep that in mind. Um, and lastly, in working with a number of police departments, I think you and I have had this conversation um, but in all the past experiences, we see that spectators, community members, and parents bog down the emergency responder's ability to get to the threat if everybody starts flooding the school. Yeah. And our four schools are in neighborhoods with limited access. And so that is something that I know, I know it's, it's that knee-jerk reaction um, as a parent um, or as a loved one, uh, but coming to the school is not a good idea. <laughs> and because we are so small, let us do our job, but we'll do it. We're going to do it quickly because it is a small campus, it's a small school. But because it's also small, if you, you clog up, that it's definitely going to be an issue, safety issue. Yeah. Um, and I say that knowing I'm a yeah. parent too. Yeah. Two girls. It kills you. Yeah. So, um, but. Um, yeah. Hopefully it never gets here if we do the right thing, like I said, and um, from what I've seen, being new to this town, that's so important. And it, it's really great because we are so small that the littlest thing I've seen, it, we've, we've had a ton of these that have made to my phone, like, what do we got? And we're immediately on it, but probably within the hour, it's immediately, no, nope, we're here, it's not that what happened, this is what happened. We talk, and it's the end of it, no one even hears about it, because there's nothing there. It's when it's like the tipping point. There's nothing there, but the right person throws something on social media that doesn't get the story right, and then it perpetuates itself. And that's where we're, so we're looking at going, what story are they getting? And then when we start taking it back, and it takes a lot of time and resources to do that, uh, but we, we have to do that. And we find out, no, it's what we thought it was. It was just um, people yeah. getting hold of social media. So um, we're happy to take questions from the board. There's just one more. Do you have the communication plan? Could you also just throw that up real quick? Um, you know, communication is an ongoing process for, for myself personally, for the school district. We're committed to getting it right. Um, we worked together, and a huge thank you to uh, my administrative assistant, Linda Powell, who's been painstakingly working on, on getting this uh, together for tonight. Um, you know, parents have the right to know what they can expect from communication. And so this is really like an internal process that we wanted to make public. Um, you know, from the schools, you're going to be hearing that top ban of, of communication, and, and you do pretty regularly. I think I just heard there was a bear on the playground at Wells Road School last week. <laughs> pretty sure that happened, yeah. So you're getting those kinds of communications. Um, sometimes, often, we're communicating with the adults, with the parents and staff. Um, our secondary students have those email communications. Uh, we might get on the PA and share something with kids. Um, but I wanted to share this matrix. You know, it's not an exact science. There's exceptions to every rule. There's situation sometimes supersede what we thought we would do. Um, but in general, these are the situations that arise in schools. 
commonly, um, it's not an exhaustive list, certainly. Um, and this is how we utilize our school messenger tool to communicate. Um, all of this will be shared um, out via school messenger email to all of our uh, parents tomorrow morning, um, along with our presentation tonight and a letter to follow up on recent um, topics in, in district. Um, and we're going to be sending out this as well as what I just shared with you. Um, really just trying to continually improve, continually foster that two-way communication so that when we know better, we do better. You know, we're human and everyone's working at lightning speed to um, keep kids safe. You know, so that's really our primary goal. So thank you, Scott, for being here. Yeah, so and just, you know, to end it, there's a lot of things that we have here that even your other towns don't have. Like, I don't know if you know, the schools have direct communications with our dispatch. A lot of, a lot of many school systems don't have that. So um, there's things that we have, there, a lot of things we're doing right. Uh, communication is always the tough one, right? It's always when do we, when do we not. Uncooperated information. But the minute we get credible information, that's immediate. As immediate as it can be goes to me, to, to Sherry, or sometimes right from the officer to the to the teacher or whoever mm -hmm. is the, the first person, and that snowballs mm -hmm. and, and it, it gets out very quickly. Yeah, you'll see here like words like confirmed, right. <laughs> you know, and that takes a little time and resources and, you know, but it's important. We can't send out a mass communication that is not as accurate as it can be. It may happen, but we don't want to do that, so. Are there any questions from the board? Well, I was going to ask confirm exactly, and, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, the, this slide is is great and, and really informative, and just to differentiate confirmed threats. So when a threat comes in, or you're alerted that a threat was made out there, um, you so what? So we understand you're doing the work to find out if it's substantiated. Is it? an actual threat or was it kids more threatening language, language or yeah you're not going to send out communication unless you've determined it's a credible threat correct Confirmed. and there will be times where on tuesday there is nothing to communicate we wrapped it up with a nice neat bow but then wednesday we learn more our investigation continues more students come forward now this is evolving, and now we need to communicate something, and now we've learned more. So it's a very fluid process. We're working with kids. We're working with human, little humans who have big feelings and emotions and friendships, and they protect each other. You know, all good stuff that also can be challenging, um, certainly on the school side, and I know, uh, you know, on law enforcement side as well, to get all those facts. So we make our absolute best determination with the information we have at the time and we're always open to learning more and doing something differently that's why on that first slide you saw like and revisit do we have to go into lockdown and revisit do we need a shelter place revisit should i be calling scott now so it's a very fluid thing um in each each yeah. school district if you look at the news i'm sure mm -hmm. i i mean bloomfield, bloomfield durham Sunfield, Waterford, Avon, everybody durham, um, yeah. they all handle it differently right some had a little some had a uh, just a media that was a you know a fishing thing where it just hit their hit their uh, emails. Others were schools. There was another one that was a kid fight. So, but they all handled it differently. Some didn't didn't open the school. Others, the school has business you know as regular normal business. Others just had extra officers. So, depending on the culture and, and what the expectations of the community is, um, you know, we'll not. I'm, I'm your police chief. You know, so you let me know how you want to police it and and what expectations you have us and we can change it to, to your community. But um, that's what we operate mm -hmm. under now. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I, I'm on the phone with all the community, especially capital community. I mean, you know, the capital area, there's like 33 of us um, towns that we talk every day, texting, what do you got? What is it, what, you know, what happened there? And, you know, how did you handle it? What, you, you know, so behind the scenes stuff, we never stop. And I have the same network of superintendents, many of right. whom you know, and I, you know, we're doing yeah. the same thing when these, yeah. when these things happen. So. And thank you very much. This was enormously informative um, and helpful. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask is, because this chart is really very handy, and I think it, it helps identify the expectations, um, uh, you know, uh, for, for people in town. Um, are you going to make this public? 
Yeah, it'll be on our, our website tomorrow morning. I'm sending it out to all families, um, but certainly any member of the community can see it through our website. Um, and I'll likely be highlighting some of these um, communications in the next drummer submission a month from now. Okay. So I think it's important for the community to know what we are able to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anybody else on the board have questions? I just have one quick one. One and one is a comment. I think maybe we should publish this on some of those social media pages that. Yeah, you'll uh, notice the social media column is is a yeah. lot of knows because that's not where we do our business. Yep, totally agree. Um, I heard the term or the acronym SRO. I apologize. I'm not oh, familiar. Oh, sorry. Oh, school okay. resource okay. officer. Okay. So that's fine. That's probably everything. Program. Yeah. Just to, like what I was getting at was a, a police officer just guarding a school or yep. there to arrest kids on their, you know, their behavior is not the greatest. <laughs> Yeah, that's not. <laughs> just was an acronym that I wasn't familiar yeah. with. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Chief, Thank for being you. here. Thank we you. really appreciate your insights. All right. Don't forget to Oh, you took. <laughs> All right. Moving along to uh, public comment. Uh, Granby community engagement and attendance at Board of Education public meetings is welcomed and encouraged. As is our custom, the board views public comment as an opportunity for members of the public to share their comments and concerns with the board, and board members will not be responding to comments or engaging in a dialogue. As it deems appropriate, the board may place such matters on the agenda for future meetings for discussion in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. Procedurally, public remarks will be limited to five minutes, and speakers will be asked to identify themselves by name and address. We expect comments to be respectful and civil in tone, and we do not permit name calling, raised voices, personal attacks, or vulgarity. Lastly, we note that the superintendent is responsible for student and personnel matters. No speaker will be permitted to use public comment to bring complaints against any teacher, student, or staff member, or to discuss student matters, which are confidential. Therefore, the use of student, teacher, or staff names is not permitted. Any such complaints or concerns should be directed to the superintendent and her team. Um, as usual, we will start with uh, public comment for those who are present in the room, and then we will move on to uh, Zoom. If you, do, if you are on Zoom and you do wish to make public comment, go ahead and enter something into the chat so we can make sure that you're in the queue and you aren't missed. Is there anyone in the room who would like to make public comment? Good evening, my name is Mike Kamarenko, Notch Road. Um, first off, I'd like to go back to two weeks ago. Um, I still haven't heard back from Ms. Parsons or Ms. Burke regarding the questionnaire that was given out in the high school. I'd like to know um, what teachers asked the gender question at the high school. I'd like the names of the teachers and to know who they were. Were they disciplined for breaking the rules? Uh, last year it was an accident um, that these questions were asked. Um, it's Ms. Burke's responsibility to let these teachers know what is acceptable. Um, bullying is my next issue. It seems that, um, that if the school doesn't constantly sweep bullying under the rug, people wouldn't take it as the school's trying to hide things. Um, Ms. Greer, pulling her stunt in 2023 just adds to- Mr. Kremarenko, I've asked you not to use names, oh, please. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is just the way I have it written. Um, proving the school doesn't care about the parents or children, they just care about pushing their agenda. The assault that happened at the high school last Thursday has proved the school doesn't care about bullying. This bullying issue was reported to the school at least several times last year, and nothing was done about it. We all see what happened. Because the school swept it under the rug, a student from Granby was jumped by two students from Hartford. Um, but come to Granby to go to school. My understanding is that at least one of the girls from Harvard is known to be a troublemaker. I'm going to ask you to please refrain from speaking about student matters. Why? This is in regards this, to this the, is regards to the school and bullying. This is all regards to bullying. Because this was all reported and nothing was handled about it. And now a student went to the hospital and there's two students arrested um, because Not of bullying. True. Mr. Kremarenko, I'm going to ask you to refrain from saying from speaking about things where you don't necessarily know the truth. I know the truth. I know the families. Then the I, families could come and speak. Okay, I can speak too, it's can't very, I? It's hurtful to our students when you call them out in such a public way, and I have a responsibility How, I'm not to saying protect names. our students, I'm all not, of our I'm students. I'm not saying names. I'm just saying I'm commenting on the incidences that happen. 
You're giving many identifiable characteristics, that, and this is hurtful to our students. I ask you to please refrain from okay, doing so. so. If it was your daughter, I know that you would not appreciate the I, level of I detail. I would appreciate someone The level of detail her. that you're speaking about other people's children. Okay. Please try to be a bit more respectful and still get your point across. Um, my understanding is the school uh, made an announcement asking students to erase the videos because students videotaped the incident. Um, then administrators pulled several students aside asking them about the phones and to make sure it was erased from the phones. I mean, these are criminal investigations. I'm sure the attorneys to the victim would like copies of these videos. Um, You guys are asking students to destroy evidence. You know, this wasn't a fight. This wasn't a one-on-one. -on -one. This was a two-on-one. -on -one. They wanted to hurt this girl. Um, next, I'm going to... National Band Book Week is October 22nd to October 28th. Some of you all ran on wanting our kids reading about blowjobs, fingering, vaginal Excuse stimulation. Excuse me, sir. No profanity. Does this offend you? It's this is available to our students in, in, in the libraries, in the schools. Got to come back. These are available. This is pornographic books in our schools. With everything going on in the media, we should be teaching our kids what to look for in grooming. These books are illegal for any other adult to give a child outside of school, but it's okay in our schools. Next, I'd like to go with the cell phone policy. Uh, the cell phone my daughter carries is mine. You guys will be getting this all in writing. No one at the school is to take her phone at any time. It is to remain on her person at all times and not to be locked up in any way. Um, the shooting threat that happened on Friday, the student, you guys did not notify the students of the middle school that there was a threat. I was able to notify my daughter. I was on my way to pick her up. Um, other students may use their phones for to check their blood sugar levels, you know, to remind them to take medications. You know, students need phones nowadays. And lastly is communication. Um, us parents talk to each other. We know what's happening in the other schools. You guys try to hide everything from us. You guys want to protect your reputation. You don't want to protect our kids. Is there anyone else in the room who would like to make public comment, please? Going once, going twice. All right, moving on to Zoom. Is there anyone on Zoom who would like to make public comment? Yes. Hello? Good evening. Hello? Good yes, this is Ms. Reagan, Hungry Road, Grandy. Um, I would like to congratulate Mr. Kamenko in speaking what is supposed to be a public session in which I think he made one slip by mentioning one name, and we understand that. However, for him to relate what his concern is, he had to refer to the incident that happened recently where we had to call in the police or where you had to, or where the police had to come into the school. Now, the protocol that you uh, gave us earlier this evening, is that the protocol that was followed or already established before this incident happened? Or is this just smoothing over the covers and raking the sand to make everybody look good? I'm very concerned, like Mr. Kremenko and others in our town, that you are hiding things. Now we should have, or should be able to have, and I address this to the chief since I can't get the answers from the board, is to exactly what happened. What happened? Who started it? When did it start? How did it start? How did a girl end up going to, apparently with a concussion, to the hospital? Was she hit with something? Was she beaten by the other two people? But we need to know those details, not just that you've got a protocol going forward in case something like this happens again. We are owed the story of what happened. That's all I have to say, but I will continue to say that the Board of Education 
is a total disappointment to us. There are lots of nice little cutesy things, lots of cackling and laughing about things, lots of we are going to have to do this going forward. Uh, we, we had a protocol in place. That's all very nice, but what actually happened? Because to tell you the truth, we can go on the patch and we can see what happened to a motorcyclist, get all the details, get his name, get the car that ran into him, find out what his age is, and we can get the details there as to what happened, but we don't know what happened in this particular incident. And I think we are owed that. And if in fact, the chief or whomever decides that it's something that they can't share, won't share, shouldn't share, whatever it is, then I think we should be able to get copies of the police reports because I believe they are done. And I believe that the chief has to approve uh, releasing that information. And my final question is, if you won't release the information, why is that? Thank you. Is there anyone else on Zoom who wishes to make public comment? Going once, going twice. All right, I am closing public comment at this time. Uh, moving along to student representative reports, and just like I said, Sophia, you are on the hot seat as uh, Katie um, was unable to make it. Okay, so these first few weeks, we've had a lot going on at the high school, including our open house, which was held on September 10th from 6 to 8, where parents were able to come to the school and see the different classes available and talk to teachers. Uh, we also had our school pictures on September 17th, held in the community gym. Uh, our drama rehearsals for the Twisted Tales of Poe have also begun, and it looks like we are going to be having an amazing play this season. Uh, in addition to that, the jazz band and chamber singers are starting their tryouts in the coming weeks. And also, there will be an informational meeting held for all parents uh, regarding the French exchange program happening this spring. Uh, tomorrow morning, seniors will attend a senior planning meeting for, our, for parents and students during PLC and a virtual meeting held for parents later that evening. And October 1st, uh, there will be an all grade planning meeting for future success through the College and Career Center with Ms. Peterson. And also on October 11th, there will be a the annual blood drive held in the community gym through the Red Cross. Uh, later that evening, the girls volleyball will have their annual fundraising event, and this year they're doing country line dancing as their fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And that's held in the community gym as well from 6.30 and 9.30, and that will be run through Stomp and Boots uh, line dancing. As for the sports, uh, volleyball, the girls' volleyball team has a game tonight versus Rockville. And on Friday, they will be playing SMSA home. The boys' soccer played East Granby away, and they also have a home game versus Canton Friday night. The girls' soccer also played East Granby yesterday home, securing a win 7-0. The girls' JV has a game away versus Canton, and Varsity will also play Friday away, also versus Canton. Yesterday, our girls' field hockey team had an under-the-lights game where they secured a win uh, versus Summers, 8-1. to one. And tomorrow, the girls will play Old Saybrook away. Uh, our boy, or varsity football team has a big game versus Coventry away Friday night, and JV will play the following morning versus Coventry home. Uh, Cross Country had their meet yesterday uh, away at Summers versus Coventry, East Granby, and Summers. And that's all. Great. Good Thank job. you so much. Thank Excellent you. job. Thank you. Volleyball one. Katie did. Oh, volleyball one. <laughs> Katie did report, but she it's an away game, so she won't make it to the meeting. But they did win. They did win. <laughs> okay. okay. That's a good excuse to not make it. Yeah. yeah. All right, moving on to business requiring action. Um, the, the first up, we have the board uh, the minutes um, in regard to the Board of Education retreat minutes from August 13, 2024, and the Board of Ed minutes from our last meeting, September 4th. Um, do I have a motion? 
Uh, I'll move that the Granby Board of Education approve the minutes from the August 13th, 2024 Board of Education retreat. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? I abstain. Abstain. And uh, can I get a, a, another motion in regard to the September 4th uh, board uh, meeting? Yeah. Uh, I'll move that the Granby Board of Education approve the minutes from the September 4th, 2024 Board of Education meeting. Do I have a second? I'll, I'll second that. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Um, business requiring action. Um, the Curriculum Policy Technology Communication Subcommittee. Uh, oh, I guess I could. I can. All of us. All, both all of us. Both, <laughs> both committees actually reviewed this. Uh, the Finance Committee re uh, reviewed it today um, in regard to the non lapsing education fund, and we're bringing it to the board for a second reading and approval. Um, I'm looking for a motion in I, regard to this. I move that the Granby Board of Education adopt. Policy 3171.1, Non-Lapsing Education Fund, as recommended by the Curriculum Policy Technology Communications Subcommittee. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Um, any discussion in regard to this fund? I might just say that we discussed it at length in the Finance Committee this evening, and we also have discussed it with other town boards and we have no objections, and that is why we can recommend this moving forward. Thank you, Donna. Any additional comments? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you so much. Reports and discussion. Um, Director of Finance and Operations Report, FY24 year-end budget transfers. Nikki, raise your Yes. Um, I'm happy to report um, that the FY24 budget did end on a positive note. We had 235,269.86 in unexpended funds with the FY24 budget. Um, in the general fund, there are approximately, well, there's over 600 accounts. So with that over the course of a year, um, we tend to have some accounts that run negative just due to expenses that are more than budgeted but then we also have accounts that we had we realized cost savings so they have an available balance so at the end of the year and as you'll see as part of the memo in your packet we do like to make those negative accounts whole so at this time we like to transfer any positive balance in those accounts to make those negatives so to speak go away uh, the Quality and Diversity Fund also ended on a positive note um, with $95,335. That was our ending balance, which is now our beginning balance on July 1. Revenue to the town was also positive with, all, with over $2.2 million in revenue from various sources. Um, these sources include regular and special education tuition from other towns, uh, pay for participation fees, and the state-funded excess cost grant. And the last um, item on the year-end update is in with regards to the non-lapsing education fund. And this is with regards to the request um, now that we do have approval of the education fund and the non-lapsing moving forward. Um, with the remaining funds of 235, 269.86, we are recommending that $200,000 be returned to the town and that 35,269.86 of those unexpended dollars be deposited into this account. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Once again, I would add that the Finance Committee reviewed this uh, FY24 year ending budget report and uh, approved the report. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Can I get a, a motion, please, in regard to the transfers? I move that the Granby Board of Education approve the FY24 year-end budget transfers as recommended by the Director of Finance and Operations and Finance Personnel Facilities Subcommittee. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Karen. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? All right, thank you. The motion carries. All right, now we are getting to some work on what's going on in our school district with our kids learning. Um, when we talk about the summative testing report, um, uh, Jennifer Parsons, our assistant superintendent, is going to share the results. Thank you so much. No and thank you problem. for your patience. I know that we're going a little long tonight. No, absolutely. Thank you for um, having me this evening. Great, thank you. <laughs> so it's my honor to bring to you our annual state testing report. Um, each spring, in compliance with state and federal requirements, the public schools administer the summative state assessments to measure student proficiency in relation to grade level standards in English language arts, which we also refer to as ELA, mathematics, and science. These assessments, which involve the Smarter Balance Assessment for students in grades three through eight, the school day SAT for our juniors at the high school and the next generation science assessment for grades 5, 8, and 11 provide an annual snapshot of student achievement and a way to monitor growth over time that is used alongside our day-to-day -day curriculum based data by our educators to inform instruction. The first assessment I'll talk a little bit more about is our school day SAT. As of 2016, all high school students participate in one state-funded administration of the school day SAT in March of their junior year. Students may choose to have additional um, administrations of that test. Uh, those additional administrations are not captured here in this data. This is just the one-time assessment uh, in March. The school day SAT is now completely computer-based. And it was recently revised to, um, for those of us who may remember in school, it was more of an aptitude test. Now it's an achievement test aligned to standards. And that was a recent revision, as was bringing it completely online. Students receive two subscores, one in evidence-based reading and writing. This is the English language arts section of the SAT uh, that focuses on gathering evidence in the meaning of keywords and phrases from passages. So you receive a score in the ERW and in math with, with each subtest being a maximum of 800 points for a total potential score of 1,600. The proficiency benchmarks, when we talk about a student being proficient, those benchmarks are set by the state and they are also part of our graduation requirements. As a performance standard, that is a 480 in ERW and 530 in math. In looking at the results of all assessments, but I have it here because we're looking at SAT first, we analyze the data internally at the district, school, grade, teacher, and student levels through a variety of lenses. We may look at whether a student, um, we may look at their various subgroups, such as their gender, their race, their ethnicity, their uh, whether they receive special education services or not. But we also compare our district results with the trends of the total state population and other districts in the area. In 2023, just last spring, the state revised what they call their demographic reference groups, or DERGs. In this revision, Granby was reclassified as a DERG C district. Other area districts within the 28 identified in DERG C are East Granby, Suffield, Holland, Region 7, which is New Hartford area, and Region 10, which is Burlington and Arlington. So based on these factors, every town was reevaluated, and you can see the state map in the corner. And these are the towns that are most similar to Granby based on factors such as income, education level, occupation, family structure, poverty, home language, and district enrollment. Previously, you may ask, uh, who are we compared to? We were compared to some of the towns um, that are more local. Avon, Canton, Simsbury, South Windsor, West Hartford, um, but things change over time and we have since been reclassified into Dirk C. So when I, we do district comparisons, we will be looking at that group. In 2024, uh, this chart shows our school day results over the past seven administrations of the assessment. 83% of Granby students were proficient in the ERW. They met that benchmark or exceeded it of 480. The average score in Granby was 562. This is a, the overall proficiency level is up six percentage points from the previous year and reflects a rebound to proficiency levels from 2017. 
These scores are significantly higher than the state average, which you can see on the next chart. And this score uh, puts us at third within our DERG. So out of the 24 districts that had enough data to share, uh, we are falling third in that, in that DERG C. What you see on top, um, in order to preserve sort of consistency year over year, these are the districts that are our area districts that we have always compared our results to. So you see that not only are we falling third in our new DERG, but we're falling third in the uh, Farmington Valley area. Go back just one. In regards to math, 50% of our students scored in the proficient range on the math section of the assessment and had an average score of 526. This proficiency level is down slightly from the previous administration, but still above the administration before that. When we look at this, it, we're still 20 percentage points above the state average. And when we look at those uh, Derg B towns, we fall seventh within the area. But in our new demographic reference group, we are falling fourth out of 22, indicating that several other districts are also really looking into their math scores. While we celebrate the high level of proficiency and growth in regards to English, we acknowledge the need to create action steps around our math achievement. The high school will be working with students to utilize the, their PSAT scores that they received this fall. Uh, and each student will be looking at their scores and goals and moving forward to align instruction with the SAT in our newly revised math courses. If you remember, we did uh, about four years ago, realign our middle school math uh, courses and that is coming up through the high school right now with students who have that realigned middle school experience are currently starting their junior year I'm going to shift to smarter balanced assessment our students at Wells Road and Granby Memorial Middle School participate in both the ELA and the math smarter balance assessments in April and May. So all of our students in grades three through eight fall in those two schools in Granby. There's three sections of the assessment, one in English language arts that involves reading, writing, language conventions, which encompass your grammar, your vocabulary development, um, editing and revising skills, as well as listening skills. And there are two sections in math. One is shorter discrete problems and one is a performance task. That's an extended four or five part problem solving um, task. All of the sections of this assessment are also administered electronically and are adaptive at times, which means that the test will change the next question, the difficulty of the next question based on how students are performing on the questions that they have received. Students receive a scaled score between 2,000 and 3,000 that can be compared year over year. So if a student scored at a 2,050 in third grade, we would expect that score to rise. They may score at a 2,225 in fourth grade. So you can compare that over time. In addition to the scaled score, students also have a proficiency level between one and four that is detailed at the bottom of this slide. Levels three and four are considered proficient, and that's what we look at when we move into our analysis. So on these charts for both ELA and math, you can see um, because uh, the difference here in comparison to the SAT is that the Smarter Balance is administered year over year. So the same cohort of students takes that assessment over the course of six years. You'll see a little bit of a blip there in between 2019, 2020, something may have been going on in the world. Something um, happened. <laughs> so we did not have state testing in that year. But other than that, when you follow a color down in a diagonal uh, downward facing trajectory, you're following roughly the same cohort of students over time. In 2024, 66% of our students in grades three through eight were proficient in English language arts. And that is a main maintenance level from the year before. So we are maintaining the work that we are doing, as is the state. That was the same trend over the state this year. There was no increase overall. Three grade levels, you can see fourth, which is purple, 
fifth, which is blue, seventh, which is yellow, and eighth grade in that pink was almost right there, with their individual grade level scores being at or above 70%. And that's what we're aiming to move towards across all of the grade levels. There's a need to review the scores for the entry level grades at each school when students transition from Kelly to Wells, when they transition from Wells to the middle school. We're seeing a little bit of a dip in those grades and we need to dig in and figure out exactly why that is or if that is indeed part of the, the reasoning behind some of those scores being a little bit lower. Granby scores are significantly higher than the state average at 49%. And we ranked in the top half of the Derg C districts at 11th out of 28 and sixth within our area schools. In the area of math, 54% of students in grades three through eight were proficient up slightly from the previous year and moving in a positive direction as the state average decreased. So the state went down, we went slightly up. So we're moving in a positive direction right there. The scores result in placement at 20th out of 28 in our DERG C group and ninth in our area group. A highlight of the math results is the 22% growth in seventh grade and the maintenance of 65% in eighth grade. So we need to really look at what is working well in those grades and how can we duplicate that over all of our grades because we really wanna aim for consistency and that's a trend that we're seeing is why are some of our grades not quite performing at the level that we would expect, which impacts the overall um, performance. And we really wanna dive in at the student level and look to see how we can support each of those students in regaining uh, that proficiency level. The last assessment I'll talk about is the Next Generation Science Assessment. And this assessment is given at uh, certain benchmarks throughout a student's experience. It's administered in grades five, eight, and 11. Uh, that doesn't mean we're ignoring it in the other years. What we do is we see an accumulation. We've divided the content up over all of the grades uh, instructionally. There's a high level of literacy built into this assessment. But there is also science content and an overall application of what we call the science practices and the cross-cutting concepts. Granby students historically score very high on this assessment and you see that this year we maintain an overall proficiency level of 75%. This level of proficiency results in the third highest scores in both our area schools and in Dervisy overall. In comparing our 2024 proficiency levels on our summative assessments to the superintendent's goals of 80% in ELA and science and 70% in math, there is room for continued improvement, especially in the area of mathematics. Granby consistently scores higher than the state average and falls in the upper half of districts within Derg C. We are looking at specific math-based strategies as listed in the superintendent's goals that were presented. But additionally, work will be done with all staff to connect our instructional practices to the new teacher growth and evaluation model. This will promote increased teacher feedback and result in increased performance as well. Staff will engage in peer observations and conduct building level walkthroughs in addition to analyzing student level data and professional meetings using our new tool called EduClimber. These practices are aimed to improve achievement overall. So for the grade overall, for the district overall, for this, uh, all of our students overall. At the student level, work will involve goal setting and analysis of intervention supports and structures available for individual students acceleration. And instructional specialists are working to revamp what we call that multi-tiered systems of support, our MTSS structure, formerly known as SRBI or RTI. So how do we identify students through that day-to-day -day assessment in need of additional um, strategies and structures and how do we administer that level of support? 
um, in addition to the day-to-day -day classroom, small groups that should be happening to target small group instruction. And the last thing I would mention is that um, engaging in our sec uh, secondary scheduling study, we anticipate that will also result in implications for how we can continue to maximize instructional minutes and how we can design student support structures, at, especially at our middle and high school, where sometimes it's harder when there's a lot of competing courses for students. And just to clear, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jen, but if you just don't mind clarifying for people who are listening, you might not know what that, that study is. Do you sure. mind just summarizing yeah. that real quick so people understand so what we we're doing? So we are working um, with an outside agency to look at how we schedule um, the, the within the day, not the overall start and end times, but within the day, how do we schedule our classes and periods and how can we use um, any structures and recommendations to inform future budgeting, future opportunities for students to go across both campuses since they are so close. We have that beauty of having everybody together um, and also um, how that can be beneficial for everybody, students, staff, families. Thank you. Yeah. That's the end of my report. Oh, there are any questions? Can I ask of you? Absolutely. All right, so if we look at the ELA grade level smarter balanced results, pull them back up. Is it accurate to say in 2023 through 2024 that one 56%, that's down 9%, that that same group was at 65% the year before? Yes. Okay. So if you follow that. Yeah, that's what, that's what, I, was, that's that, what I was figuring. Yep. So that wow. cohort, our current seventh graders, when they came to us in third grade, the year after we came back to school, right? Um, they started their third grade testing progression with 44% proficiency, which is the lowest we've seen in third grade. Right, but they got up to 65%. They, they grew. And now they're back down to 56%. They haven't retained it, yes. And that, that so those kids are listed as current seventh graders, mm -hmm. but Correct. that testing window was when they were finishing sixth, Correct. right? Correct. So that seems like that's that dip we were talking about when they're transitioning between schools. Yes. Right? So they ended fifth grade on a really strong growth progression, and they didn't maintain that in their sixth grade year as they started a new school. And that's where I'm talking a little bit about the schedule, like how many minutes of um, reading instruction. So we're, that's where we're diving in a little bit. And the standards get harder. Mm -hmm. So in sixth grade, um, the main shift is that you're looking at taking multiple texts and compare, comparing across multiple texts. So where up through fifth grade, you were looking at one poem, one book, analyzing it, now the expectation is you can do that simultaneously for two and then compare. So we've identified them obviously as a group that's of concern. A group that we're looking at individual student data. I should, I would be remiss if I did not say that 1% is about one and a half students. So there's a group, if we look at a 9% change, that's about 10 to 15 students that we really need to look at their individual scores. But and let's say, how many students are in seventh grade? About 130. So that's still a good percentage. That's, you know, mm -hmm. almost 10%. Yes, so we're gonna look in, so, while this is overall trends, the work at the buildings is looking at every individual student. How are they growing? Maybe in fifth grade, they scored two, per two points into proficiency, and in sixth grade, they scored two points below proficiency. How do we accelerate and maintain? So that's the work that we're doing right now. In the same regard, if we look at the math, we see a lot more unfortunately Negative. slippage yeah. yep. from 2022-23 to 2023-24 to 24, you have the third to fourth graders slipping there and then fourth yeah, to fifth significant. and then fifth to sixth mm -hmm. so have we identified anything that we can do in particular for this group clearly there's a something going on with this group of 
great. And just, yeah. just to build on to that real quick, I'm sorry, uh, just to build up into that, it seems like math's a problem everywhere, too. So I believe it, but it seems like there's a like, report. There, there's yeah. there's layers of issues going on here with math. Yes. Um, so one of the things that's a little bit different than our previous conversation we were just having is that um, over time we're seeing similar trends where we dip a little bit in certain grades. It's not just this one group. It happened with the group before. So now we really need to look at. Um, when we see something like that, we're really going to start to look at instructional practices. Do we need to embed like fact fluencies? And so what we can see is we can look at this data, but now what we need to do is we need to look at the fifth grade that dropped a little bit this year. Fifth grade also drops a little bit the year before. We need to look at on what strands and on what standards within the test are they not performing as strong because if one group dipped and then the next group dipped, but on totally different standards, then that's more of an individual level concern. Whereas if we're dropping, let's say in geometry concepts year over year, that's a curriculum and instruction. So that's where we're really diving in now. Um, the one thing I will say, and I have said it before about math, um, none of these are excuses because we know that this is not acceptable and we need to increase the performance overall. Um, but math is cumulative. So with English language arts, you build up the ability to read and then you really work on comprehension from third grade to the time you're an adult. Once you've cracked the code, you're really just figuring out how to dive into like complexity. For math, there's 10, probably 10 new standards every year. So you learn everything from fifth grade, and then you add 10 really new complex things in sixth grade. And if you didn't quite have the fifth grade, and now you're adding new, you just have to look at how that accumulates over time. Have so, we identified any specific areas? Do we know yet from the testing that it's the geometry, it's the uh, double digit multiplication? Do we have an idea of where the deficiencies lie? That is the work we're doing right now. Um, we can say, if you remember when I introduced the assessment, uh, with math, there are two pieces to the assessment. There's that discrete problems. There are those discrete problems. But then there's that performance task where students are expected to persevere for 45 minutes plus on one problem that has multiple parts. Mm -hmm. And so that's another piece that we're looking at is, you know, which is, which is stronger. And a usually, at that point, right? usually yeah. it's the performance task that is much more difficult. And so, it's, it's yes, you're different. asking all the right yeah. questions, and they're the same questions we're, we're asking as well. And the test is very language dependent mm -hmm. as well. You know, the multi step problems and um, directions, and, you know, the format is, can be challenging as well. As I always say, Reading is across the board in every subject, whereas math is just limited to mm -hmm. math and maybe science. <laughs> so you're at a disadvantage unless you can increase your number of math classes, really. Right. And the, the math section, I mean, I help administer this test. The math section is very heavy um, language, mm -hmm. too. It's not just mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. um, I have some questions, too. I'm curious, sure. you know, in, in talking to our teachers prior to um, the meeting tonight, it sounds like the concern about um, turnover and retention remains among our members. And I'm curious if we see any connection um, between educator turnover and subject matter or scores. Like, could any of this, um, any of the challenges with what we're seeing with scores relate to challenges with certain departments or with keeping teachers overall and, and retaining folks we have who are great? Yeah. yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that there's a direct correlation. Like, you know, we go back to a teacher and say, you know, what, what happened in your class? But when you look at um, the middles, so when you look at grades three through three and four, we have six to seven, usually six teachers within that grade um, and a high level of consistency through our planning meetings. When you look at um, fifth grade, we have three teachers in each content area. 
And then when you look at 6th, 7th, and 8th, we have one or two teachers teaching every student in that area. So um, that is a part of the analysis that we're doing is looking at how, you know, how teachers are doing with um, consistency over time, with accelerating students. Um, I can say a highlight for us has been that seventh grade. Uh, over time, they gained 11 points last year, 22 this year, and we have had teacher turnover in seventh grade math. So it may be a factor, it may not. So that's definitely an aspect we're looking at. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if uh, when we look at the scores of other districts, if we see a higher performing district, is there any chance that maybe our teachers could visit those schools and talk to those teachers and see, well, what are you doing and how, you know, get some professional development? Yes, that's always an option. I was at a meeting um, with other folks in similar roles yesterday and we were talking about this exact you know common th thread for all of us is looking at student achievement and we talked about looking to see you know how can we find like districts how can we celebrate successes and our next meeting we'll be talking about systems and structures i'm always hesitant to immediately send staff out um, but it's always great to look at other districts to see what is happening analyze it and when we've kind of verified that the instructional practices are a major factor and why the achievement is increasing, then we would send staff out. And we have districts come here. And we have districts come here. Yes, we had Avon come here for Quite math. Quite a few districts yeah, came to watch our ago. math instruction this past year. So although the numbers may not be where we want them, as Jen shared earlier, this is a focal point across the state. And um, you know, I wanna make sure that it's shared that we had some very prestigious districts come and look at our instructors to learn about the practices that we're using, the materials that we're using, particularly in math. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not to say these scores are where we want them, but it's it's a concerted effort across the state and country, particularly since COVID, where we're seeing um, low levels of proficiency in these areas, and we're constantly looking to improve our practices, and educators learn best from each other. I'm also curious, I think I asked part of this question at curriculum um, last meeting, but I know there was a shift in the math curriculum to the illustrative math program um, that occurred while these students were in school. And I know we have a coming shift in our reading curriculum that is not necessarily our choice that is mandated by the state. So what have we seen and what, what might we anticipate from a shift in curriculum? and the impact on, on our students. And obviously, it takes teachers a while to become comfortable with the new curriculum, too. Yeah, and I would, um, I would say, I wanna, be, I wanna talk about resources, curriculum, and standards. So the standards have not changed. The resource that we shifted to use in math changed. The instructional strategies for teaching the same standards. Um, was the shift there and that's what we'll see again next year with ELA is that the standards are the same the resource is shifting and so in essence we should be covering all of the same content with both the math uh, the illustrative math the strategies and resources we're using and the same will hold true next year in K3 with ELA that being said our middle school was the leading edge of that work and I think that you can see with the the 59 and 65 percent those being two of our highest grades that the teachers when we can retain them and keep them in that same grade level mastering the curriculum the resources the standards for that grade level we are seeing the the fruits of those efforts there and it's how do we this is only our second year at the elementary school really using that math resource. Um, so that is another aspect we're looking at. As far as ELA, it'll take a little bit longer. We're only shifting in K3. <laughs> Does anyone else have any additional questions? Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you. Thanks to Superintendent Parsons. This is um, very informative and
that math section keeps keeps killing us. <laughs> We're gonna get there. We'll get there. All right. Uh, next up, um, item C and D are first reading of revised policies. Um, first is revised policy 3541 transportation. The second is revised policy 6146 graduation requirements. Did you want anyone to speak to these? Or I believe these were reviewed in the curriculum committee. Yep. Um, Jen can yeah, no get... questions have come forward Okay. at this point. They were minor edits, really, I would say, to the policies to comply with legislation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, committee reports. Um, curriculum policy technology communication met at our last, um, uh, was subject, the first meeting in September, the date of which is slipping my mind. Um, and then finance personnel facilities met tonight. Dana? Yes. We reviewed the FY24 year end update and approved that. We also discussed the non-lapsing education fund, which the board has approved this evening, and the need to transfer funds into that new non-lapsing education fund, which will happen because it was approved. The other thing that we discussed was uh, some changes potentially to reporting with regard to finance and uh, the finance committee getting more involved in the evaluation of contracts. For example, the busing contracts the food services contracts, and that is something that we are going to be doing going forward. And lastly, we were advised that they are interviewing for the new facilities person, mm -hmm. and that was what we discussed this evening. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Donna? All right, thank you. Uh, moving along to other board-related reports, um, CREC, CABE. Um, we're still looking for someone who can possibly attend some of the CABE meetings. Um, one of the things that I did want to say is that oh, in, in the past years, we've been able to um, apply for um, outstanding board um, awards. There's two different leadership awards. We're unable to um, apply, or we're unable to qualify this year because um, we have to have additional representation and engagement with CABE. Um, so I just wanted to make, I wanted to be transparent about what's going on with that and why that didn't um, happen. So if anyone is available for CAVE, again, I, we have a board that works full time. Everybody works. Um, so, uh, uh, and everybody puts in a second job here. So um, that's appreciated um, immensely by everyone here. So any, any involvement, engagement you can take elsewhere is appreciated and understood um, how, how um, difficult it can be. And for, for folks who might not know, the meetings are at like 11 a.m. in person in Hartford or something. Because yeah. I had looked into it, and that's that's it's why none difficult. of us can do it. Right. So it, it makes it very difficult for us to attend those. Now, we're able to attend all the webinars and um, individual sessions, and many of us do do that on, on a fairly frequent basis. Um, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of the them are in person. So, um, Granby Education Foundation. So um, I was not able to attend this week for family reasons, but I did check in with um, Lynn Gelzo and Kim Becker from GEF. So they um, they told me that they're receiving some questions about possible grants from folks at the schools. So they're looking forward to receiving proposals. Um, they want to give out money. So I hope our um, educators are applying for that. They are actively recruiting new board members and would love anybody to email info at GrambyEducationFoundation.org to apply to join. Um, and they also stated that the tentative date for the Grand B is April 25th. Already? Mm. Already. They've already looked at that date. So, <laughs> all right, start getting your teams together. Yes. Clever name. And more importantly, costume. Yeah, I've yes, got costumes. <laughs> Clever team name and costume. Mm -hmm. Very, very key to that event. There was a very well done zombie performance by Wells, Wells Road last year. That would be recall, hard right? to top. It was. Well, they it was were good. beat out by our student rep and his team. <laughs> they were. Sesame and the Sesame Street gang. So. That's true, but I did enjoy the dance number. I'm just saying. Um, Multi-sensory. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the calendar of events, I'm not going to go through all the details, um, but it is attached in the packet. Uh, do we have any board member announcements? No. All right, thank you. Um, action items. Madam I Secretary. didn't. I didn't hear any this evening. Just you know, ongoing review of um, data. I didn't hear any either. Okay, thank you. And superintendent's report. 
I have a few items. Um, first, I want to say thank you to our Granby Education Association. We still have a few diehards in the back. Thank you for um, hosting a pizza tailgate um, before tonight's meeting. Uh, really wonderful to connect with um, our hardworking teachers, and I know that the board appreciated the opportunity to get to know some of you on a more personal level. Um, it's it's just a, a great feeling to have those, um, those informal conversations, so thank you for that. Um, I'm very excited to share that we do have a new assistant principal for Granby Memorial High School, Dr. Hannah Dill will be starting on October 7th. Um, Dr. Dill comes to us um, from the middle school in Summers, Connecticut, where she has been an assistant principal for the last few years. Prior to that, she was a high school social studies teacher in South Windsor. She has awesome energy, a wealth of experience and knowledge that will round out our tremendous team at GMHS. Um, so we're really excited to, to welcome her um, in just a couple short weeks. Um, we are interviewing for the Director of Facilities, as you've already heard. Um, we are in open house and curriculum night season, so um, both middle school and high school held their open houses already. They were well attended and um, really very positive. Um, our Wells Road um, curriculum nights are this week, and Kelly Lane will, will um, be next week. You can check the website for more information on that. Um, the middle school is holding their first PAC meeting of the year um, this Friday, September 20th at 9 a.m., so that's open to any middle school parents um, being held in the media center. We do have our first early release for professional development happening on September 25th. And we have two holidays being observed in October, so there is no school on October 3rd or October 14th. Um, due to that October 3rd holiday, I do just want to make note that we will not be holding the October 2nd Board of Education meeting. So we're down to one meeting in the month of October due to that holiday schedule. Um, I also want to share that our elementary PTO um, has publicized their their first two meetings of the year. I know that this will soon be shared at open houses and on um, social media and our website. October 2nd at 6 p.m. at Kelly Lane is the first PTO meeting of the year. November 7th at Wells Road. Um, and these were just communicated this afternoon, so I just wanted to announce them, but more will be coming out. Um, we often hear about challenges of, you know, unfunded mandates and um, legislative decisions that impact our schools. Um, I wanted to share that next week I am partnering with a couple of area superintendents um, to have a just a small converse, small group conversation with um, our representative Tammy Zawatowski and Senator Kissel um, to really advocate for some of the educational issues that are important to us um, as smaller districts, um, particularly in the area of funding for special education and reimbursement to towns. Um, you know, I do partner with area superintendents in, in so many things, and um, really having our voice heard, particularly as smaller districts, is really important at the state level, and so I um, just wanted to make you aware that I would be doing that um, in my role as superintendent, but certainly I'll report back to the board anything that I'm able to hear. Um, if I could just take a moment, um, Chairperson Logan, to address earlier comments. Yes. Um, I think it's important that I use this opportunity to do the best I can to articulate the importance of HIPAA, the importance of confidentiality, and the importance of protecting each and every member of our school district. When we categorize students by the town they reside in or a mistake that they make, we set them up for failure in our small community. Um, it is easy to figure out who that child may be. And so for those reasons, it is of the utmost importance that I am a voice of protection for our students and our teachers. Um, we are always available to conversation, 
we can disagree. You can send in an email to ask GPS. You can call me, email me, or knock on my door. But to use this podium as an opportunity to air dirty laundry does not become part of the solution. So I want to be part of the solution. And I know that members of our community also want to be part of the solution. When we use a platform to speak truth, which in fact is riddled with inaccuracy, it unfairly, it unfairly harms children. Zero police reports uh, were confirmed or validated over the last week. There was a complaint by a member of our community to our local police, of which it is every member's right to do so. That was not upheld. No child in our school district has been arrested. No child in our school district has harmed one with criminal intent or hospitalization or any significant uh, issue. You can fact check that because in fact police record is public record. When we spew details as though they are fact, people are harmed. It needs to stop. We need to be models and positive examples for our students so that the very bullying that folks continue to speak of can stop. This isn't a school issue problem. This is a community problem. We need everyone's help, everyone's. I am the first to admit we will make mistakes. As a parent, <laughs> I make mistakes every day. Until we are willing to put those differences aside and collaborate and roll up our sleeves and admit when we make a mistake, which I will always be the first to do, we will not be better. I have said over and over again, we're this close. We are so close. What I shared this evening with Police, of Ch Police Chief Sansom has been in place in Granby Public Schools for more than a decade, likely two decades, because I know the emergency manual I used as a model was uh, done under um, our previous uh, two or three superintendents. So state law hasn't changed. We've always had to be a safe school district. We've always had to be one with protocols and procedures to keep each other safe. We take that seriously. My reputation means nothing, but the safety of our children will always be our first priority. So I think that this is not a practice I want to make common in our board meeting, but I want to make it very clear that I will stand up for every child in our school district, and we cannot let false information skew the perception of a really fabulous place. So thank you for allowing me to make those additional comments. Thank you, Sherry, or, uh, Superintendent Burke, very much appreciated. All right, we have reached the end of our meeting. Does anyone want to make a motion? I move that we adjourn the Se meeting. Thank you. Second? Second. Does anyone want to talk about that? No? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you for everyone who stayed and stuck it out. Uh, we had no choice.